Warning, this podcast contains violence, sexuality, gore, and other horrible and disturbing things. Listener discretion is advised. Also, the hosts of this venture are ignorant dipshits, so please do not take anything they say as fact. And enjoy the show. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good, then we'll begin. Today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. It is our basic human right to be forgot. A second plane now has crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. Put chemicals in the water that turned the friggin' frogs gay. The defendant shall be incarcerated for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. 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 So, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to Occulty Veritatis Podcast. I am Sage Murray, along with... Ood Gallifrey. And Richard Bigley. Alright, so, I'm doing an episode on Nathaniel Barjona. So, born David Paul Brown on the 15th of February, 1957, in Worcester, Massachusetts... Massachusetts, Nathaniel Barjona, which is what he changed his name to later, and I'm just going to keep calling him that. He was a super gross piece of shit monster, and we definitely need some poison for this one. Sorry, not sorry. Love you. So, what's your poison? So here we have some Coors Slice, which I think we've had before and is not uh, yeah. great. Have we ha- we had it before? Yeah. I oh. think maybe we should consult the spreadsheet. I'm oh. pretty sure we've had it before and it's gross, but you know, it is what it is. It's all good. Oh shit. I got it. because. Oh, it- I pronounced it wrong. It's Wooster? Wooster. 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 He was born in Wooster, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Oh, good God. Wow, I shouldn't throw beer like that. That's Richard gets that one. <laughs> <laughs> These cans. See, the, if we covered this before, this is going to be a test on whether our ratings are consistent. Right. Rental skin will know. Zero. Zero. This is terrible. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Just channeling your inner Leon. That's right. <laughs> this stuff's awful. Why? I, I'm sure I said it was awful before, so I think I'm pretty consistent with that. It's no good. Yeah, yeah. Tastes kind of like you're drinking, like the, like like in like in your elderly aunt's house, she has that bowl of potpourri with like the dried oranges in it. Like that's, <laughs> like that's what this tastes like. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. If you could translate that into a taste, it doesn't taste like real orange. It tastes like orange flavoring, mm-hmm. and not Yuck. not good orange flavoring. <laughs> yeah. I'll still drink it, but it's... It, it, it's like you took a glass, you know, like you, you had a nice refreshing glass of orange juice, and then instead of washing the glass, you just decided to pour your can of beer into yeah, it. But no, like beer, some, sometimes beer, like a, like a, like a white like beer. Like a wheat beer will, will wheat beer, be yeah. good with the citrus and that's that. But, but this is terrible. This yeah. is Coors yeah. with like... A hint Big. of orange no, juice. No, it's like, no, it's with like orange potpourri. Orange potpourri. Okay. That's like dusty from like s- sitting on the toilet bowl. Yeah, dusty so orange toilet bowl potpourri. Yeah, so the, the regular Coors sitting beside it was fourteen ninety nine for a four pack. This was nine ninety nine. Can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we know why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it, and I'm notoriously easy to please. <laughs> like if it's cold, that's what they said. If it's cold and wet, usually I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Wow, <laughs> that's wow. what they said. Yes, yeah, that it is, yeah. s- serial killer quotes. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. And even even this has like that artificial bleh I don't like. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm gonna give it like a three out of ten. Yeah, I'm gonna give it like a two and a half. Bleh. How do you? That'd be B W E A H. I think so. E A H. I think I would go. Bwah. Yeah, because yeah, bwah. You put that on the spreadsheet. Yeah, because if you (laughs) if you put the A on that, it puts a little more stank in the E of the bwah. Stank in the E. Yeah. So rental skin. You can see whether or not we're (laughs) consistent with our bullshit. (laughs) I highly doubt that we are. Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Barjona, I was doing the math this morning. And I noticed that 10 years and 10 days ago, 
that a 10-year-old boy went missing. I wonder if you can tell me something about that. Um, basically, um, what happens according to the, re the police reports I read is that he was walking to school and never made it to school. Do you have your own impression as to whether he's ever likely to come back or not? If you had to kind of put money on it, you know, bet the farm, as they say. I'd like to hope so. Yeah, but that's not what I asked. We all like to hope so, right? I don't think I'd take the bet, because I just don't know. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's just a level. I just can't. Three years after Zach's disappearance, police stumbled onto the man who would become their prime suspect without realizing it. So in December of 1999, three years after Zach Ramsey disappeared, one of our Great Falls police detectives was driving down this street right here by Lincoln School and observed a man dressed as a policeman standing on the corner. Nathan Bar Jonah, a 43-year-old Great Falls resident, was arrested by this school dressed as a police officer, carrying a fake badge, pepper spray, and a stun gun. Well, I don't know how many volts it was. It was a cheap, cheap stun gun that I had for protection. Protection against who? Anyone that decided to mug me or, or whatever. Uh-huh. But had you also been dressed when you had the stun gun in a way that could make somebody think that you could have been a public servant? I wore a jacket that looked like a, a cop's jacket, but uh -huh. it, it had no insignias, it had no badge. So it wouldn't have fooled a policeman, in other words? I don't know if it would fool a cop or not. You think it could have fooled me? I don't know. After they arrested Bar Jonah for impersonating a police officer, they searched his apartment. But his apartment was so incredibly full of filth. Police found thousands of photos of kids organized in binders, journals written in code, and something even more alarming. While we were searching Nathan Barjona's apartment, we found lists of names. But in particular, we found one list on a yellow sheet of paper. And on that list was Zachary Ramsey's name. And the last word on the list was the word died. It's my understanding that they found pictures of kids in there. They found a lot of clippings. We found boxes and boxes of pictures of children, cutouts. What do you mean, clippings? Clippings from magazines uh -huh. of, of various things. I mean, Christmas scenes, uh, kids, adults, people in Halloween costumes. But it wasn't just kids like they implied. But there were some of kids. Well, yeah. yeah. When you're working on these cases, you do get into their mind. And you have to get into their mind, because they don't think like you and I. So back to this monstrous piece of shit. So from childhood, from childhood, Barjona displayed disturbing behavior. In 1964, he received an Ouija board for his seventh birthday. Promising that he would let her try it out, Barjona lured his five-year-old neighbor down to his basement, where he then tried to strangle her. Thankfully, his mother heard the little girl's screams and ran downstairs to force her son to release her. Sorry, how old was he at that point? Seven. Jeez, like, I, I wonder, in the 1950s especially, when he grew up, there wasn't, like, an influence of, like, stuff to give him that idea. Because I've seen little kids try to emulate, emulate things they've seen on movies and media, but for him to just want to do that at seven, I wonder if he's seen it somewhere and thought it'd be a good idea, or if he just came up with that like, urge to strangle on his own. I think it, like, I honestly, I don't know, I wasn't able to find a ton of information, like, when he, whoops, when he was, uh, really small, but I think, I think he was just, just not very well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, his mother just kind of assumed that her son didn't know what he was doing and didn't think, uh, much more on the incident, which I think is super fucked up, because, as you'll, you'll hear. In 1970, Nathaniel decided to try again, but was more successful this time. So using the promise of going sledding, Barjona lured a seven-year-old neighbor out to a secluded area where he sexually, like, raped him, sexually assaulted him. Jesus. Another incident that occurred a few years later continued the pattern. Barjona attempted to 
lure two boys into a cemetery with the intent of murdering them. But the boys were kind of sketched out and refused to go with him. So they basically dodged a bullet. Man, I, I always wonder, like, what kind of sixth sense I should listen to. Because, I mean, those little boys that got out of there, they had to have been skeeved out by something. Yeah, and they were just young, too. Just yeah. young boys. Uh, in 1975, when Barjona was 18, he dressed up like a police police officer, uh, a theme that we'll see again and again, and abducted an eight-year-old boy named Richard O'Connor and put him in the trunk of his car. Luckily, a neighbor was looking out her window and witnessed the kidnapping. She called the cops and they found his car parked in a parking lot away from all the other cars. The cops ordered Barjona out of the car and discovered O'Connor in the back, sorry, in the back seat, bloodied and near death, having soiled his pants in uh, in terror, basically. Jesus. Barjona had raped and strangled the boy. And guess how much time Nathaniel Barjona received for kidnapping and raping, kidnapping, raping, and nearly strangul- like strangling, strangling an eight-year-old child to death. How old was he at that point? Eighteen. Six months. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be something like way under. One year of probation, <laughs> not even <laughs> not even jail time. One year of probation. Jesus I wonder what kind Christ. of lawyer would have like managed to pull that one off. Yeah, you know, especially given like, did they know at the time that he had these other past incidents? Like, I don't think so. Like that's another thing that you'll see. It's just it's this is a. It was a real frustrating episode. Yeah, and, and like <clears throat> that's bef- that's before the age of like really good court transcripts. So I'd love to know like what the fuck the the defense came up with to right. get him that kind of yep. sentence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a few days before graduation, Bar Jonah took a drive out to Hartford, Connecticut, <coughs> and again with his cop impersonation mo, adu- uh, bleh, abducted a nine year old girl and raped and assaulted her to the point that she started convulsing and vomiting. Barjona basically chucked her out of the car and onto the sidewalk, and luckily a witness saw it and his license plate, which led to his arrest. Unbelievably, the news of this assault never made it back to his uh, probation officer. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's like the number one thing you should know, right? But I mean, it's because it was in Connecticut instead of uh, Massachusetts. That seems to be kind of a recurring theme up until like you know maybe the mid to you know mid nineties when you know computers and information yeah. technology kind of really took off and, and networking because like uh, you know you you can just you know you just go to a different state and then nobody's heard of you or yeah. give them a different name and nobody's going to question it and. You know, and there you go. That's your. That's who you are. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's but it's still insane. And, and from what, what we learned from our very first episode, like that's the reason that serial killers were able to take hold so well in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, because yeah. computers weren't happening. The departments didn't have a way to communicate evidence to each other quite yet. Right. Yeah. Uh, so Nathaniel was released from his probation in May of 1976 for the earlier rape and abduction of Richard O'Connor. He even received a nice letter from the cops thanking him for his cooperation. Wow. It, was he? <laughs> did, did he happen to be white? Oh, yeah. He was very, <laughs> very much white. When's the last time? I, I want to see the letter of a black man being arrested by the cops and them thanking him for his cooperation. Christ. Especially for the, the rape and assault of a child. Christ. So after uh, the joke of a sentence that he received... Barjona started to get even more bold and cocky. So three years after that incident, on September 24th, 1977, he abducted another two boys outside of a movie theater by, you guessed it, impersonating a police officer and telling the boys that they were under arrest. He handcuffed the boys and then drove them out to a secluded area and raped them. Yeah, that's what that's what inherent blind respect for authority. <laughs> yep. Christ. So then the uh, 375 pound Nathaniel decided to try and silence a p- potential witness. He strangled and jumped on the chest of one of the kids until he was convinced that he was dead and just left him out there. He put his other victim in the trunk of his car and drove away. Thankfully, the boy who was presumed dead actually survived and he ran to get help. Barjona was soon found with the other little boy still in his trunk. This time, Nathaniel was charged with attempted murder and sentenced to 18 to 20 years in prison. Christ. Yeah. Man, like, this is probably just the way I see it. I'm not basing this on anything, but it seems like 
death by strangulation and death by crushing. He basically sat on this kid. Yeah, but like it seems like such a prolonged like a prolonged way to deliver pain. Like if you wanted it to be quick, you would use like a knife and cut the jugular or you'd shoot them, but like strangulation and crushing, like that's dedicated looking into the terror of your victim mm-hmm. for like 5 10 minutes at a time while like the air leaves them. Yeah. It's it's fucked. Yeah. He started choking me, strangling me. Um, And I remember his hands wrapping around my throat so tight that I swear I felt like it was going to pop my head off. He grabbed me, put me in a chokehold, and tried to break my neck. Strangulation puts pressure on the carotid artery or the jugular. They control blood flow to and from the brain. Stopping that blood flow can cause death in four to five minutes. People don't realize how fast you can lose consciousness. Like this reporter asking an MMA fighter how fast she could take out an opponent with a chokehold. She tells him three seconds, then shows him. One, two, three. Oh my God, he's out, he's out. When a victim survives, the damage may not be apparent until days or weeks later. Blood clots, a stroke, even brain damage. So while in jail, he started meeting with a psychiatrist. He told the psych that he had fantasies about murdering, dissecting, and eating children. The psychiatrist recommended psychiatrist psychiatrist recommended that he be transferred to Bridgewater State Hospital. On March 22, 1984, he changed his name to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Barjona. He gave a few reasons for the name change. He told his friends and relatives that he wanted to know what it felt like to be discriminated and persecuted as a Jew. Oh, what? Yep. <laughs> Yep, that okay. was a, that's a thing. That's a thing he said. So, uh, was there any context surrounding that? He just wanted to know what it felt like. I mean, d- why would you seek that? I mean, it doesn't seem like the Jews are happy with it. I don't know. But then uh, during an interview with Dr. Michael Stone on the TV show Most Evil, he claimed that he was actually Jewish and wanted his name to reflect that. That who the fuck knows? Because that can't, like no, no one's been able to confirm or deny that. Uh, In 1991, Superior Court Judge Walter E. Steele ruled that Massachusetts had failed to prove that Barjona was dangerous, and he was released. They they failed to prove he was dangerous after all his history, and like him admitting that he wanted, that he had fantasies of killing and dissecting children? And eating children. (laughs) Did, how do you, how do you... Like, did they not get that information, or did they just like glaze over it? I think I think it was just like like a domino of f- fuckery. Oh man. Yeah. Incompetence does so much pain. Mm-hmm. So then he moved uh, to Great Falls, Montana, I guess, because he didn't want to be in uh, Massachusetts anymore. Yeah. And, and that's also where his mom lived. So he kind of lived one to. They wanted him to be near his mom. Yeah. And, and like Richard said, in that time, if you move to another state, you can be a new person. Mm-hmm. Like, no, like people aren't going to have a reliable way to find out about your past bullshit in the mm-hmm. 50s. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So like a month after he was released, Barjona spotted a seven-year-old boy sitting in a car outside a post office in Oxford, Massachusetts. He just like takes his show on the road. He went inside the car and tried to crush the kid to death by sitting on him. Huh. A bunch of witnesses, including the father of the boy, rushed to his rescue, scaring Barjona off. A police officer actually recognized his description from 15 years before, and Barjona was arrested. At first, he told a bullshit lie that he was trying to get out of the rain. <laughs> <coughs> yep. <laughs> and and j- I didn't see the kid. I just sat in the car, and I thought it was. Uh, I thought the heat warmer was just jiggling. I thought it was one of those fancy vibrating cars. Yeah. Uh, but he did later admit that he was trying to kill the kid by smooshing him to death. So somehow, no one from Massachusetts followed up with anyone in Montana. And Barjona was again sentenced to one year probation in Montana. Huh. Like, how the fuck does this keep happening? And, uh, like, choking is <laughs> choking is a horrible way to die because it's like ten minutes of, like being throttled but like being crushed is the same thing because every time you breathe out you lose a little bit of lung capacity and because you have so much weight on your chest you can't get that lung capacity mm-hmm. back well and like this like he was like he's a big man yeah he's i don't know like i what he's was three, it, like 300 pounds yeah like over 300 pounds i mean 
I have lots of little cousins. I've had little toddlers jumping on my chest and I'm gagging, so Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of one of the biggies in this case. So on the 6th of February, 1996, a 10-year-old boy named Zach Ramsey left his apartment at 7.30 to go to school, taking his usual route through an alley near the 400 block of 4th Street North. Zach was wearing a jean jacket with green sleeves, a blue football jersey with his last name on the back in gold letters, stonewashed jeans, and black high-top runners. A family who lived near the alley reported seeing an off-white four-door car nearly run him over. Another witness said that they saw Zach standing in the alley, looking like he was waiting for someone. Yet another witness, who lived near the end of the alley, said they saw a distressed Zach with an obese adult male following a few feet behind him at around 7.45. Yeah, and that that sounds like our protagonist. Mm -hmm. And yet another witness reported seeing Barjona leaving his, or sorry, taking his garbage out in that same alley while wearing a navy blue police type jacket. Shit. Hmm. So at some point in that alley, Zach Ramsey disappeared and has never been seen since. A judge declared Zach legally dead in 2011 despite the objections of his mother, but put, put a pin in that because we'll come back to that. On Friday, February 6th, 1996, 10-year-old Zachary Ramsey was walking to Whittier Elementary School in Great Falls when he was presumably abducted. The school honored Ramsey with a memorial garden near the building's front entrance. However, the garden has come under disrepair in recent years. MTN's Josh Menny has more on the efforts to refurbish the garden. I went to school here in elementary and I remember when this flower bed was beautiful, but over the years it has taken war, wear and tear and it needed to be redone. Eagle Scout candidate Alex Thayer decided to refurbish the Zachary Ramsey Memorial Garden for his Eagle Scout project for a variety of reasons. One, to just beautify Whittier Elementary School. Two, to serve as a cautionary story for parents with young children and finally, to just remember Zachary Ramsey. On his walk to school the morning of February 6th, 1996, Ramsey went missing. So for years, the police had like no leads and the case went cold. But Barjona, all this time and as reported by witnesses, lived super near where Zach disappeared. Allegedly, he had been secretly luring young boys over and sexually assaulting them, even hanging them up uh, by a hook that he had installed in his kitchen. Cru- like, <laughs> hang them like slabs of meat? Yes, or? hang them like slabs of meat. Fuck. Like through, like through their, like through their body, or did they like tie them up on they a would rope t- and they would t- hang tie them up and hang them? Up. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's less gruesome than I had originally imagined. <laughs> yeah, so. it's oh, just wait. <laughs> I was thinking some. I'm te- sure it gets better though. It, I was it thinking does. some Texas Chain Massacre stuff, you know. Oh, pretty much. Oh no. Uh, so these crimes went undiscovered <coughs> for years. One woman did grow suspicious after her kid suddenly became withdrawn and angry after spending time with Barjona, but no one thought that there could be a child rapist slash murderer living in Great Falls. So it was around this time that his neighbors described barbecues and other food that Barjona would give them. Oh, Oh, this is this is the worst foreshadowing (laughs) that were made with unidentified meat that Barjona claimed was from a deer he shot, though no one could ever recall him going hunting. Oh, I every I mean the neighbors didn't know, but everybody that's listening to this podcast knows exactly where this is going. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. So in 1999, Nathaniel Barjona was arrested for impersonating a police officer. He was busted outside a local elementary school, uh, carrying a fake gun and all dressed up in that Navy jacket. The cops searched his house and uh, were surprisingly unprepared for what they discovered. In the house, investigators discovered thousands of pictures of kids cut out of newspapers and magazines. More importantly, they found a bone identified as belonging to an unknown young male. Hmm. They also found a super weird journal written in code that was sent out to the FBI. Around this time, the cops kind of started looking into the possibility that Barjona had something to do with the disappearance of Zach Ramsey. They determined that he had access to his mom's four-door off-white 1978 Toyota Corolla the day of the boy's disappearance, and that his mom and his brother were out of town for a funeral. Mm -hmm. 
It was also discovered that Barjona didn't show up for work on the 6th of February 1996, as well as the days following. Christ. And, like, he, he seems to fit the definition of disorganized killer, but, like... Usually disorganized killer have a hard time holding down jobs and regular life things, but he seems like he was able to own a house, make payments, keep up with work. So Mm -hmm. he was just another guy bullshitting at the lunch table, and he was doing all this stuff. Yeah, all this fucked up stuff. How do, like, people let their kids near that guy? Like, I'm just curious, like, was he, like, exceptionally charismatic, or was he, like... I I heard that that he was, like, pretty, like... like jovial and you know like ha oh, ha I'm just a nice big guy ha okay. ha cuz I'm, I'm just like you know cuz like when you're saying well and she you know her kid became withdrawn after spending time with Barjona it's mm-hmm. kind of like well why or how would you allow this person near the the child also it was know? a different time right I, I guess so and it seems like there's a lot of kids just kind of being left unattended in yeah. these places but, I mean, being a being a big guy myself, like I, I recognize there's a bit of like chubby jolly guy privilege because I've said things that are borderline assholeish, but they come off as like playful because I look like a big friendly guy, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of get that. Right. Uh, so again, while searching his apartment in 1999, the cops found a list of boys' names, including a bunch of his known victims and a Zachary Ramsey, spelled Z A C K E R Y. And I suppose that's going to be important later. Well, followed by the word died in all capital letters. Ooh. Yep. They also found a ton of newspaper clippings about the Ramsey case. A former roommate even described, he had roommates, a former roommate even described finding clothes in the apartment that matched what Zach was described as wearing when he disappeared. And another former roommate described Barjona just randomly bringing him up in conversation like all the time. Who would just randomly start talking about Zach Ramsey. Interesting. See, th- this is this is a kind of a, a running theme across like a bunch of the people you cover because you're the main person that covers these like deeply flawed, like terrible people, and it always seems like their neighbors and like casual acquaintances all have little pieces of weird trivia surrounding yeah, them. Yeah, just but, little chunks, and when you bring them all together, yeah, it but, begins to paint a bigger picture. Yeah, if you could get them to collaborate, maybe they, they could have found out sooner, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so r- remember those notebooks that the FBI were decoding? Yep. They, uh, they discovered passages describing his obsession with torturing and murdering children. They also detailed his plans to cook and eat kids. Some notable recipes include barbecued kid, my little kid dessert, little boy stew. Were they named this? Yep. Little boy pot pies. And my favorite, lunch is served on the patio with roasted child. See, I forget who it was, but somebody else was, some other serial killer was being fucking cute with the names. Don't be fucking cute with your killing. Yes. It's it's not clever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, hey, so um, everyone was basically, like, super sketched out and thought that Barjona had killed Ramsey and fed him to them, like all those neighbors. Hmm. Uh, Barjona vehemently denied ever killing Ramsey at all, but the discovery of the gross recipes coupled with the meat grinder the cops found in Nathaniel's apartment, gross. So Barjona was only ever charged with kidnapping and sexual assault. He was sentenced to 130 years in prison and maintained his innocence right up until his death on April 13th, 2008. And he basically died of like a like car- cardiac stuff. Yeah, I, I guess something I want to say about the meat grinder is like back in the 50s, we didn't ha- they didn't have such a a huge like appliance consumer culture. Like buying another appliance was a huge purchase because. They were all built to be last for life, and like it, it was a much bigger purchase that back then. So to buy yourself a single guy a dedicated meat grinder, like usually to offset that cost in the fifties, you would have to have like a side business for it. Like you don't see many single single guys like buying a giant meat grinder all to themselves. Mm-hmm. It's just not something that was done back then, really. <laughs> nope. So I uh, remember how I said that Zach Ramsey's mom didn't think he was dead. It is literally because of her refusal to believe Zach was dead that the case against Barjona in connection with her son was eventually dropped. So they eventually just had to drop it. She was like, nope, he didn't do it. I know he didn't do it. I know Zach's still alive. I know he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. What? (laughs) Yeah. So to this day, we have no idea how many kids Nathaniel Barjona raped, assaulted, or killed. So he's saying that that 
Bar Jonah did not have anything to do with her child? Is that what? That's what she was saying. The mom. Uh huh. Did did she meet him and like was convinced that he couldn't be the guy? She knew. She knew in her heart that he was not the guy. Is that because, like, she quote unquote knew in her heart that her son was still alive? Like mm-hmm. that whole spiritual, like, he's not dead; he's still out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's because of her vehement denial that they had to drop the case, even though it's pretty obvious that he he killed that kid. Christ. And uh, there were never any definitive. There was no d- definitive proof of the c- cannibalism, but I think it's like I think we can conject that it was pretty obvious. Yeah, like. It's it's infuriating because, like, there's so little information to go on. And he seemed like a very disorganized killer. Like, he seemed to see an opportunity and just take it. Like, he mm-hmm. didn't he didn't have methodical plans where he'd plan a week in ahead to abduct a certain kid. He said, hey, that kid by the post office looks good. I'm going to try go and... Get sm- that. Well, and also he, uh, he crossed g- gender lines, too. Like, yeah. he got that little girl. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Like, obviously, he was more into the boys. But... He wasn't super fussed if a, if a girl presented herself. Yeah, it, right. it seems like, like, I wouldn't describe him as bisexual or pansexual because, like, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't conflate those things because no. I think it's much more about instilling power and like putting terror and and like pain into people. Mm-hmm. Like, well, all of the kids were like what between like five and eleven. Like, they're all just little, <sighs> little wee ones. Fuck. Mm-hmm. That that. Hurt, that hurts. I know. I'm sorry. They, like, they, they, they couldn't understand what was happening. They must have been so scared and confused. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, that's my episode. For Occulte Veritatis, I'm Sage Murray, along with... Ood Gallifrey. And Richard Bigley. Sorry, not sorry. Love you. Bye. Bye-bye. Once again, we travel a hundred years into the past to see what was on the airwaves in February 1920. And it was Billy Murray with his song, You'd Be Surprised. Enjoy and see you in the after show. Johnny was bashful and shy. Nobody understood why Mary loved him. All the other girls passed him by. Everyone wanted to know how she could pick such a bow with a twinkle in her eye. She made this reply. He's not so good in the crowd, but when you get him alone, you'd be surprised. He's kind of scared in a mob, but when he talks on the phone, you'd be surprised. He doesn't look like much of a lover, but you can't judge a book by its color. He's got the face of an angel, but there's a devil in his eye. He's such a delicate thing, but when he squeezes your hand, you'd be surprised. He's scared to death in a boat, but when you get him on land, you'd be surprised. At a party or at a ball, I must admit he's nothing at all. But when he takes you home, you'd be surprised. Mary continued to praise Johnny's remarkable ways. To the ladies, and you know advertising pays. Now Johnny's never alone. He has the busiest phone almost every other day. A new girl will say he's not so good in a crowd, but when you get him alone. You'd be surprised. He's kind 
kind of scared in a mob, but when he talked on the phone, you'd be surprised. I know he looks as slow as the eerie, but you don't know the half of it, dearie. He's got the face of an Eskimo, but there's fire in his eyes. He doesn't say very much, but when he starts into talk, you'd be surprised. He isn't much standing still, but when we're out for a walk, you'd be surprised. I'll admit he doesn't look smart. He won't impress you right from the start. But in a week or two, you'll be surprised. Alrighty, hello occultists out there. This is Ud Gallifrey with the After Show. Uh, we're gonna start to do more updates here because some of the stories we talk about are constantly moving and updating. Especially one that we're going to tackle in the future. Um, I'm in the background researching a case on Onision to present in the future, and holy fuck, that's firing up. So much has happened with that person in the past, and with the recent addition of the FBI and Chris Hansen in his life, uh, it's going to get more updated. But today we're talking about Michelle Carter, um, the person who convinced a friend of hers... Uh, perhaps boyfriend, still some controversy on that, Conrad Roy to kill himself by sitting in the cab of a truck until carbon monoxide poisoning overtook her. Now, she was convicted guilty of involuntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 months and began serving it in February 2019. Uh, Late January 2020, so this month, she got released from prison on good behavior. So, she served 11 months of a 15-year prison, uh, sorry, a 15-month prison sentence. Michelle Carter spent just 11 months of her 15-month sentence here at the Bristol County House of Correction. And tonight, Conrad Roy's family says they can begin to heal. She really liked to stay busy. The Bristol County Sheriff describes Michelle Carter as a model inmate, the now 23-year-old walking out of jail four months early. Yeah, Michelle Carter's early release is based on state law. They're allowed up to 10 days, a good time per month. Carter was in jail for her actions as a teenager when she relentlessly texted and called her then-boyfriend Conrad Roy until he killed himself in 2014. What happened with my son is tragic. Roy's family has been pushing for assisted suicide legislation since his death. In a statement about Michelle Carter's release, his mom said, it is now time to focus on the positives in my life. I will continue to honor my son every day, keeping his memory and spirit in my memory and find ways to help others who may be experiencing what I've experienced. Carter's family drove to their Plainville home without comment. It's about 45 minutes from the cell she's lived in for 11 months, pictured here, now empty. While the sheriff says she was a good inmate, he says he feels sorry for the victims in this case, the Roy family. We can't undo what's already done, but we can do everything we can while people are in our custody to try to make sure it never happens to anyone else. And Michelle Carter will be on probation for two and a half years. In that time, she's not allowed to profit off of her case, so that means no book deals or documentaries. I see people online absolutely furious about this decision to let her out early. And I think that even if she served her full 15-month sentence, there would be people that were furious at her being let out. But... Even though we covered the case, and even though I understand, like, the aspects of it, and how she very dutifully, like, convinced that young man to get back in that dangerous environment that was the car that caused his death, this is a troubled individual as well. She had mental health issues that weren't being properly addressed, and a lot of that isn't brought up. And even if none of that was true, even if she was totally guilty, how long are we supposed to keep somebody like this in prison for? Like, I know that we have a very westernized version of justice in podcast land. Most true crime podcasts are western, and most of them have a lock them up forever and throw away the key mentality. That person is garbage, we don't need them in society anymore. And I think that 
prison should be about reform and rehabilitation and reintroduction. Like, the end goal, the positive end goal would be for Michelle Carter to successfully re-enter society with her mental afflictions addressed and cared for and have her being a productive member of society. I don't want people rotting in prison, as radical as that is, but nonetheless, she was released from prison on good behavior after serving 11 months of a 15-month of a sentence. Uh, if you want to go back and listen to our episode, it is case number 10. Case number 10 is where we go over it, and we even read the text messages live. Remember that justice is not an absolute rule. Justice is a system of philosophy that humans created that we think we can separate people from society and rehabilitate them. Like, this, the way we built justice is just an aspect of our society. It is not absolute. It is not all-knowing. It is not perfect. There's so much room for improvement and reform that I just can't celebrate somebody being stuck in there for the rest of their life. So, genuinely, besides the horrific damage she caused to Roy Carter and the rest of his family, I hope that Michelle Carter has a successful, happy, moral life, and I hope that she goes on to thrive. Why would I want anything different? I don't want anybody else to suffer. Why would I want more suffering in a case that already has plenty of it? Anyways, that's my that's my leftist belly aching bleed heart bullshit of the day. So hope you liked it. Yes, as a general rule of thumb, as we pass out here, make sure to wash yourself before going on any dates, especially if you might think that date might end in a sexual way at the end. It's just way less anxiety and way less worry if you already know your genitals smell like peaches. I've been Nude Gallifrey with The After Show. Have a great night.